fairness, equity, you know, societal justice, much of that really comes down to the idea of the rewards that people get in society. And so the idea that pay should somehow be fair, to me, strikes right at the heart of a society that dispenses rewards you know, to its people. So how many people here think you're fairly paid? Think about your job. How many folks think they're fairly paid? Okay, 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 okay. I actually get more hands raised when I'm, I'm seeing students in you know, part-time and in those type of jobs. Uh, they probably haven't experienced as much of the world as you have. Um, but one of the issues about fair pay is this whole notion of do you perceive yourself as being fairly paid? But then on the other hand, does the government see you as fairly paid? And those are two very different kinds of things. In terms of these three pictures, what do they hold in common? You see what they see? See these three pictures? We've got a monkey rage over here. Uh, a monkey was very, very enthusiastic about eating cucumbers. Monkeys love cucumbers, come to find out. But he became enraged because some of his fellows got grapes and started throwing the, the, the cucumbers back at the researchers. Okay? Uh, you can see the look on this eight-year-old's face. Parents, what's that look? <laughs> it's not fair. Something's not fair. And uh, air rage. Air rage doubles when people have to walk in through the front of the plane through first class. If you put them in the plane so they don't see first class, air rage is half. Fairness matters. So what we're going to talk about today is why is pay fairness important? What is fair or equitable? And how does one achieve pay fairness. <laughs> fairness, if we're talking about important, if you think about some of the major tragedies and, and, and major conflicts in the world have a lot to do with economic fairness. World War II was one of those. Germany felt very unfairly treated as they came out of World War I. Uh, you have the issues of uh, other, you know, particular conflicts, the Revolutionary War, you know, we didn't want to pay their taxes, right? The British taxes, it was just plain unfair. And again, you know, these things keep voicing up. And if I looked at the, if you looked at the paper today, there's riots in Chile. And the riots in Chile have to do with economic fairness. They have the widest dispersion of rewards uh, in any country in the world. And literally, uh, like this, uh, they're on fire. In preparing for this speech a couple weeks ago, I just scanned, got on the internet for about 20 minutes. And when you speak to fairness, these things were all over the place. I mean, if I'd spent another 20 minutes, I could have had double the number. If you notice, these are probably in the last month or two. And all expressions of you know, fairness and business paying the price of not being fair. And so it's become a major, major issue in terms of businesses today. And it's part of that whole corporate social responsibility thing that, you know, there has to be some notion of fairness across the world or across business for us to, to operate. If you think about fairness in terms of the job, it has really great impacts in terms of people at work. Uh, one of the reasons people quit is not because of how much they make, it's because of the perceived justice of what they make. And that comes through in research just over and over again. Um, absenteeism, um, you know, strife in the workplace, and you know, what people justify in theft in organizations is because somehow they're treated unfairly in that organization. One of the things that's in the news 
And it's been in the news for a long time, but it's finally gotten traction. Every year, you know, it's published of, you know, women make about what, about 80% of what men make? And, you know, the injustice of that, that women's time and women's contribution is not what men's contribution is. Well, to be honest, it's a very misleading, you know, kind of information. Uh, one of the things that if you start to talk about what fairness is, it depends on how you define what's fair. Is fair going to simply be everybody is paid exactly the same? Most people don't want any part of that, actually, you know, especially in the United States and especially in, in most countries of the world. They recognize that people you know, should have differences in rewards depending on certain kinds of factors. And when you talk about the factors like merit and performance, if you talk about things like education and what people have invested in themselves and the risk they take in work, if you put those factors into the formula, what you find is that organizations are very fairly paid when you talk about, uh, about uh, anything bigger than the real small organizations. I've done these kind of studies, and, and uh, many of them are starting to be published now, where they look at firms, they take into account the contribution, they take into account the performance, they take into account factors that we would all agree that are fairly, you know, that, that distinguish people in terms of how much they make. And most corporations come within 98%, 99%, even 100%. The organization I studied, actually, I found that women were being paid a little bit more than men uh, in that particular organization. So where's the discrimination? Well, the discrimination is not in equal pay, you know, based on these contributory factors. It's in the pay gap. And there is an, indeed a gap between men's and women's pay. But that gap comes not from overt discrimination. It comes from the careers that women choose based on what they're taught, what their values are, what people tell them they should be doing. It comes from the industries they choose to work in. It comes in the jobs. And so if you talk about fairness, you know, the correction for that is, okay, is to look at, you know, some of the basic things in society in terms of determining uh, and shaping and providing opportunity, you know, to get into those jobs and to make a difference in those jobs. You can look at fairness in another way. You know, one is between gender, between races, and what's going on. You can also look at what's happening in the world in terms of the gap between the haves and have-nots, if you want to speak. And what this data shows you is how that the rich have really become richer, and the poor have sort of held their own in terms of pay. In fact, the bottom 20% of income earners in the United States, their real income hasn't changed much since the 1970s. It's changed very little. In fact, it might have actually gone down a little bit. Uh, it's really the folks that have made out the most are the people that are at the very top of the economic you know, system. At one time in our society, pay or productivity improvement was shared. About a third of productivity improvement went to executives, managers. About a third went to the people that owned the businesses, the stockholders. And about a third went to the workers. Okay? Productivity improvement for the last couple decades have gone primarily to executives, not to the stockholders and not to the employees. So that's really changed. And so one of the big societal questions become is, how much is too much? And how do you deal with you know, that wideness in terms of the inequity across people? And so one of the things that societies are looking at is, in fact, you know, like Chile, what does it mean when you have 
individuals that are never, never going to get into those upper reaches, and in fact, uh, you can create a third world economy. Peter Drucker, and I'm not sure how many people remember that, but he was the great guru of my generation in terms of business. Uh, I've advised managers that 20 to 1 salary ratio is the limits beyond which they cannot go if they don't want resentment, falling morale to hit their companies. Okay. Depending on how you calculate that number, it can be anywhere from 200, 300 times what the average salary is today. Uh, the gap is incredible. What's happening is that we are starting to see equity through different lenses. And much of it, we're looking at evidence. And you know, how do we create a society that, in fact, is fair? And I would argue that fairness has a lot to do with the rewards that people get from that society. And that really has become the challenge of our times. And so rather than just look at market competitiveness, and what we pay out there, or internal equity, we're looking at you know, social orders, we're looking at the demographics, we're looking at the relationship between executives and employees, and now more and more we're looking globally at, at what those rewards should be. What this tells us is that there's ways of achieving fairness, and there's basically three types. One is distributive, it's how much you get. One is procedural, that's how do you get it? And the third is, do you trust the person that gives you the reward? And in terms of fairness, it's typically not how much you get, actually. It's whether your perceptions that you come by it fairly is what makes the difference. And that, in fact, is why you, know, you see that huge gap, the 80 to 100%, is that as a society, we have a gender gap even though we have organizations that are actually paying fairly. I've been doing a lot of uh, research in this area for several decades, actually. And some of the things that you might sort of find interesting when you start thinking about this whole fairness notion is actually women and men think about fairness differently. When women think about whether their pay is fair, they tend to compare themselves within the organization, within the workforce that surrounds them. Men tend to think more about fairness externally, how much somebody makes at another company, another organization, another place. And so one of the things that you find when you start to try to put fairness together, people may not be thinking of the same thing. Okay. The idea that there is high preferences out there today for pay transparency and it does relate to pay sat fairness and pay satisfaction, but does, everybody doesn't want to tell everybody what their pay is. What they want to do is they want to understand why their pay is determined the way it is, knowing how they can maximize their rewards. You know, how can I have more if I want to put the effort or I want to do whatever it takes? I want to know how. I don't necessarily want to do it. And they have to believe that somehow at least in our society, it's based on some kind of merit. So in terms of organizations, in terms of jobs, you can shape people's ideas of what fairness is. It's not immobile. And you do that through pay philosophies and goals. You do it by creating a structure that balances pay. And you do it by telling people what you've done, rather than keep it secret. Because secrecy in terms of pay tends to really make it much more unsatisfying. 